Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the afternoon lecture. You can sit anywhere comfortably in this room. We will continue from last week. I hope you still remember what we learned last week. <laughs> we did talk about the essence of Buddhism, right? The hardwood. The Buddha compare uh, people who come to his teaching like four level. People who trap in the first superficial level of uh, the monastic community just get trapped in the realm of praise, honor, fame, and just addicted to that and crave for more of that. And then he will get lost in the spiritual path and will go nowhere in life. And the Buddha go on and on about clinging, clinging on the precept, clinging on the view, clinging on meditation, clinging on uh, the wrong view, without realizing that the, the ultimate goal of someone walk down this path is to arrive at the highest uh, state of mind, which is the freedom of mind, the liberation. That's the idea. If you have time, please go back and reflect on that. That teaching is one of the... Uh, a beautiful teaching and it's considered an advance. I did not take you deeper because it's going to be more vocabulary that may confuse you. For example, like Jeto Vimutti, Panya Vimutti, what is liberation of mind, what is liberation through the wisdom. And that's sometimes confused for the new monk. But the idea is what exactly that you can expect when someone entering the teaching of the Buddha. That's the idea of that particular sutra. And this is the Buddha himself, he mentioned that after I'm gone, I, the Buddha did not appoint anyone to take his place or his position. He gave the instruction to Ananda, his personal attendant, you know what, after I'm gone, these two things will be your teacher. So in other words, the teaching of the Buddha, or Buddhism, if you like, are composed of two important elements. The first one, is the Dhamma, the second one is the Vinaya. What is the Dhamma? In this case, the Dhamma refers to what the Buddha teach, what he discovered and what he teach us. And then you need to know, where can I find that information? Almost 3,000 years that the Buddha passed, where can I find his teaching? Where are those teachings kept? In which book? Where can I find it? So the new monk you should keep in mind. And the second thing the Buddha referred to, the idea of his teaching is, of course, not just the Dhamma, but also it incorporates the Vinaya or the monastic court that laid out for uh, male monk and female monk and the lay people as well. So with these two things, it's considered Buddhism or the teaching of the Buddha. As long as monks, novices, bhikkhuni or female monk and the lay people still eagerly study the Dhamma and keep the precept. That's the guarantee that Buddhism or the teaching of the Buddha will continue to exist. But if one day the monk feel like, I'm, I don't have time to study Dhamma, start to neglect the teaching. No time to read, no time to listen, no time for school, but have time for something else. Maybe just cleaning the temple, doing construction work, greet the lay people, fundraising. Hey, is this something you sign up for to become a monk? Many people may get lost during the spiritual path, enjoy fame, become famous, good at teaching the lay people, have more followers, and then neglect to study the Dhamma. Dhamma comes into two senses. Right? You study the theory, then you meditate. You have to master both, not just you memorize the chanting, not just you know how to give the blessing or precept to the lay people. You need to know the essence of the teaching. You need to go through the text and then not just read, you meditate. That's the idea of Dhamma, to get to know the Dhamma. Not Long Po, the master, he is not just read the text. He wants to know the meaning behind the text. The text is in Pali. He cannot read Pali, so he got himself education, find teachers, study Pali until he have enough knowledge about Pali language. So he come back and come back to the text and study the text. And then it's still a lot of things still unclear. He has a lot of doubt. Many masters is like that. It's not just you are able to read. Reading is one thing to have the right input, 
what the Buddha said 25 minutes years ago. And then how can we realize that when the Buddha talk about liberation, when the Buddha talk about see let's your ear, see let's your eye, recall your previous life, recall someone past life, talk about jhana, we cannot understand jhana by reading what appear in the text. There's no way. In the time of the Buddha, there was no writing. Nothing keep in writing. People have direct experience. They come to the Buddha, the Buddha give them the meditation object, they go practice, and eventually they find, they meet the Buddha again or some senior monk, they would ask the question, this is my experience, what's next for me? So when they find Sariputta, most of people who find Sariputta, Sariputta will help that person to attain at least Soda Patana to be the stream winner or the stream enterer to become Soda Ban. And then Sariputta would point that person to the Mokhalana. And when, we, when they get to the Mokhalana, most of them will attain Arahantship. That's how they work together. You see, there was, there was no book that they can read. And the second thing is not just the Vinaya, I'm sorry, not just the Dhamma. You, you guys need to keep in mind that you need to master both of these. So you keep in mind there's a lot of things that you need to know to be a good monk, to be success in spiritual development. And many monks fall off the path by clinging on the Dhamma so much and neglect the Vinaya. Some monks hold on the Vinaya so much but don't meditate. So where can we find the teaching of the Buddha then? There's no other place better than Tipitaka. Taka means basket, Ti means tree. That means there are three baskets that keeps all the teaching of the Buddha. It is believed that his teaching, most of his teaching are kept here in these three bas baskets. The first Tipitaka is called Vinaya or the monastic court. There are eight books. Uh, I'm talking about Theravada Tipitaka in Thailand. We have 45 books. And the reason is 45 because we use the year, number of years that the Buddha continued to teach, 45 years. The day that he achieved enlightenment until the day that he passed, all together 45 years. But if you go through some tradition in Myanmar, in uh, Sri Lanka, in UK, the number of books is different. Even in Thailand, for the uh, Mahajula Lungkor, Lashavitayalai, 45 books. But for Mahamukut, Lashavitayalai, the one that we have here, is 91 books. You see the difference. The body of knowledge is the same, depending on how they want to divide it, it into each basket. Okay, let's stick with this version. So 45 books in Vinaya, another 25 books in Sutta Pitaka. Sutta means the teaching, the discourses that the Buddha, when he meets someone, he gives some talk, and then that becomes one teaching. And it is said there are about 21,000 teaching in this Tipitaka, in this basket. And the last basket is called Abhidhamma. Abhidhamma is considered the advanced teaching, uh, systemics and analysis of the teaching of the Buddha. It's kept in this basket. There are another 12 books. So all together, 45 books. There are about 84,000 these courses of the teaching of the Buddha that keeps in these three baskets. That's a lot, right? A lot of teaching is go through the development over time, okay? But still, it's considered the closest place where you can get access to the authentic teaching of the Buddha is this Tipitaka. This is considered the primary source. So if you want to know the Buddha Vajana or the teaching of the Buddha, I suggest you start from this, okay, uh, from this source, which is Tipitaka first, and go from there. There are uh, it it get translated to many languages, of course, in English, in Chinese. So feel free. Here we have both Thai and, and English. Okay, uh, the full version of the English Tibetaka should be shipped sometime this month. But for now, we still have uh, the version that's considered a small version that translated by some scholar. It's here. Okay, so you can check it out. So today, I'm going to take you some of the sutra that the Buddha used the simile of a horse. There are many teachings that the Buddha used simile uh, the way he trained monks by comparing to someone who trained horses, which is quite interesting. I don't know about your country or your tradition. In Thailand, horse and elephant is considered a high-class animal. It's the vehicle of the king. In the old time, when they go to war, these two animals 
gets praised the most. If anybody have a good horse, good elephant, they would bring those horse and elephant to the kings. Okay, so there are great horse, good horse, mediocre horse, and bad horse. Same thing in you know human society as well. You know, great people, good people, okay people, not okay people, and bad people. Similar to that. So today, uh, I will um, just just look at the name first, and we we will not cover all of this. Okay, but I just want you to see that there is teaching like this as well. And today we get to know some uh, the teaching style of the Buddha as well, which you may not see in the previous sutta that we learned. So the first sutta is called Kesi Sutta. If you see the name like this, you may not know what is Kesi until you read it. So in this case, Kesi is the name of the man, and that man happened to be a horse trainer. So the name of the sutra, name related to the story in the sutra, which is again, the guy who trained the horse named Kesi. So the sutra name called Kesi Sutta. And the second sutra is called Shawa Sutta. Shawa Sutta which refer to the thoroughbred horse, the fine horse, the excellent horse. And the, the third one is called Pakota Sutta. Pakota is a Pali word. <laughs> Pakota, you may have no idea. Pakota is like this, the stick, the stick when you hit the horse, or the stick when you hit the elephant, something sharp at the ends. So you stick into the skin of animal that animal stop. That's called pakota. Patak, we call patak in Thai. We may not cover this, okay, but let's get to know the first two teachings. You have some idea how the Buddha wants us to be trained. The first one, Chawasutta. In this teaching, there is a comparison between horse and man. Which one consider the excellent horse characteristic? an excellent man characteristic and of course excellent monk's characteristic that you can compare that you can relate that to there are four things when a man find this fine horse with these four characteristics they usually bring this horse to offer to the king so the king can use in the palace the king can use horse in the war time because these horse are considered great horse first that horse has integrity second the horse has speed he runs very fast that means the horse is strong right and the third one horse is patient obedience and the number four characteristic the horse is gentleness <laughs> okay when you see the horse uh, you need to look for this characteristic whether the horse is good or bad then you would find out okay integrity People use horse to do what? To do the work, right? Either use as a vehicle to travel or use the horse to do the hard work in the, in the right field or in the forest. So if the horse have integrity, that means the horse will be ready to do its work. Whether it's hot, whether it's rain, whether it's snow, the horse will get up and do his work. This is called integrity. You do what you're supposed to be doing without anyone come near you and force you to do your thing. Speed is the fast, okay, the strength of the horse. If the horse runs slow, that horse is not good. Horse is designed to run fast. And horse also need to be patient. In the war time, there may not enough food, there may not enough water. In ancient time, in the war time, this is how they locate the good horse. They would gather the horse into one place. And they, they will starve the horse for seven days, no food, no water, for seven days at least. And at the end of seven days or one week, they will open the gate and the soldier will hit the drum, give the signal, like loud drum, to see if any horse will run toward the fence and go to the poles which has flags toward that sound. There may be horse that doesn't want to run. There may, may be horse that feel weak. I, I'm not ready to do anything. But there will be some horses that get up and run when they hear the drum, the sound of the drum. And that is the one that they're looking for. In 100 horses, maybe 10. Take 10 of that and the rest kill them all. This is how they select good horses during the war time. 
And gentleness means, you know, you, when you look at the horse, the way he, it walks, the way it runs, the way it do things. The, in, in Pali, we call ashanai. Ashanai is a good word. Uh, English use this word. I don't know if this enough to translate the word ashanai. This means that the horse is in good qualities. It know what it's supposed to do. The horse will not, will not sleep on its own poop. The horse is very clean. He know when to stand. He know when to walk. He know when to stop. He know when the owners come. He's ready. What next for me, my lord, today? He, he don't have to wait until you hit them with the stick. The horse doesn't have to do that. It's just, just ready. What, what, what is my work today? Get on my back. I'll take you there. That's the idea. So in Trekiti, you become a monk or a man. Do you, uh, do you have in Trekiti? Do, ha do um, someone have to go find you when it's time that you need to be present here? In the morning chanting, evening chanting, meditation, the Dhamma lecture. You need to, to know what is your function, what is your role today, next week, next month, or even for the rest of your monk's life. You maintain your intricacies. Your speed refers to your wisdom. For now, you are new, you may not know a lot about the teaching of the Buddha, but keep this in mind, that you are, it's a lifelong learning to develop wisdom. Wisdom is the most important. You cannot be pure without having the right wisdom. You may fall into the trap of clinging on precept, clinging on donation, but you don't get to the ultimate liberation if you don't acquire the right wisdom through meditation practice, through samatha, through vipassana. You can keep on reading books for your whole life, but you may not be liberated. And be patient. Okay. There's another topic about patience as well. To me, patience including self-discipline, including having right view. And gentleness, this is about your precept, your sila, your manners, the way you dress, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you eat. It makes you unique. That means you train yourself in a certain level. One of my teaching monks said, you know, I, how can we train a monk if 10 monks walk past by you? 10, 20 monks walk past by you. There will be someone that you feel like, this monk is somebody. How can we build that characteristic? This monk is somebody. Just by looking at the way he dressed, the way he walked, the way he talked, the way he showed respect, the way he do things. He, he is somebody. It makes him unique among the crown, among the sangha. How can we train people like that? How can we build that characteristic? You maybe notice that some monk, when you look at them, you feel like this monk is somebody. How come he's so knowledgeable? How come he's so kind? How, how come I feel so relaxed and peaceful when having him around or hanging out with such kind of person? That's energy. That's characteristic. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so there are details in this teaching as well. So now you see the picture. And how can you maintain your integrity? How can you develop your wisdom? How can you be more patient? How can you have more self-discipline? How can you be more gentle, okay, more comfortable with your precept? Develop more good manners. Okay. Not just what you can do, what you cannot do. How can you become a person who always thoughtful of others, always considerate, always reaching out to help others? You may keep your precept clean, but you neglect to clean the temple. You neglect to help someone or your friends when help is needed. Ah, you know, today I'm just, I don't want to do anything, I just want to sit. But today is the day that we agree that we want to help each other to clean the temple. So reach out and help others, something like this. There are many good collectors that you can build. There's a lot of them. So let's get into this, this sutra that uh, I plan to walk you through in detail to see how the Buddha explained that how he trained monks to be a good monk by go through the conversation between the guy named Kesi and the Buddha himself. This is how the sutra opened up. When you first open it into the first paragraph, then Kesi, the horse trainer, oh, now you know, Kesi is the name of a, a man who trained the horse. He went to the Blessed One. Okay, now you can guess who is the Blessed One, right? The Blessed One, the Awakened One, the Tathakata. 
all of this point to the Buddha. It di different translator may use different terms. On arrival, that means the Buddha arrived and the Tathagata arrived in the case he went there and uh, paid respect to the Buddha, having bowed down, you see. Back then, people meet the monk and then they bow to the monk, sat on one side. This show that Kesi is knowledgeable of how to pay respect to the monk, to the aesthetic, even to the Buddha. He bowed and he sat in appropriate, distant, appropriate manner. As he was sitting there, the blessed one said to him, You, Kesi, are a trained man, a trainer of tameable horses. And how do you train tameable horses? horse. This is interesting keyword, tameable. Kesi is a trainer. That means there will be, it's implied that there may be horse that he cannot train and horses that he can train. So if you have a tameable horse, how do you train them? That's the Buddha asked. Kesi said, Lord, sometimes they use the word Lord. Again, point to the Buddha. I train a tameable horse with three ways. The first is called gentleness. This is the first way to train the horse. Second one, harshness. The third one is both, the combination of gentle and harshness. There are three ways that this man train horses. And what it means? If you read by yourself, you may have no idea how, how people train horse. What it means by gentleness, what it means by harshness, what it means by the combination. You think of a man get the new wild horse, right? Sometimes you train, I don't know if you have even dog yourself at home, there is a way to train okay, dog or animal. Same thing with the horse. Sometimes you feed the horse uh, with glass, with water, you play with the horse, you bath the horse, you touch the horse, gentleness. So the horse gets familiar with you and it's allow you to get closer. Eventually it's allow you to get on it and ride it. Some horse you need to tie it to the pole. Otherwise, the horse wouldn't, wouldn't allow you to get close and then it would run away. Each horse is different. So if you are expert in training horse, you need to know the nature of each horse and then find the appropriate way to train the horse. Some, some horse, you need to train them hard. Maybe don't give them grass, don't give them, don't give them water. Let the horse be starved for a few days and then get close to the horse, play with the horse and then feed him some water, feed him some food and then the horse will allow you to get closer and feel comfortable with you, this and that. There are ways to train horse. Sometimes you need to mix okay, with gentle and harsh, gentle and harsh. That's the idea. And if a tameable horse doesn't submit either to the mild training or gentleness or to a harsh training or combination or whatever technique that you train that horse, but the horse still doesn't follow your instruction, the Buddha asks, what do you do? And this is the answer. If a tameable horse doesn't, the horse doesn't follow or submit whatever technique that I use, I will kill it. I will kill it. The horse will be killed by the horse trainer named KC. Why is that? This is the reason why he killed the horse. I am a horse trainer. I am a well-known horse trainer. My family, my ancestors, we train horses. So if I cannot train the horse, that means I... You know, let this be a disgrace to my lineage of teacher. So I, I just cannot let this horse, you know, let the horse go. If you pay him to train your horse, and at the end of the training, the horse still unable to, to be trained, and then the KC either uh, don't accept your money or KC will kill horses. Otherwise, he, his credibility will be diminished. That's the idea. So he, he wouldn't. If, it's, if this becomes his own horse, he will kill horses. Kill those horses. That means the horse will not surpass his standard. So he killed the horse. But the best one said, is the unexcelled trainer of tameable person. Now the Kesi asked the Buddha, Kesi, by this, by reading this, we know that Kesi know who the Buddha is, right? The Buddha is un Excel trainer, unsurpassed trainer, peerless trainer. The Buddha is the supreme trainer. He can train anybody. 
So KC asked the Buddha, if, okay, because you are an excellent teacher, how do you train a tameable person? Again, this is the keyword, a tameable person. And I will point to you, there's, there's some sutra that the Buddha, this is the prerequisite before he trains someone. When he accepts someone into his, you know, um, doctrine, his religions, the first qualification is he needs to look through you, understand and, and know that you are trainable or tameable, then he will train you. Otherwise, he wouldn't train you. Gesi, now the Buddha answered, I train a tameable person, same thing, with gentleness, with harshness, and both gentleness and hardness. So the Buddha used the same approach as the Gesi trained the horse. You see, this is the teaching style of the Buddha as well. He repeat, so the person can relate that to what he about to say. I'm using gentleness, such as good bodily conduct, such as the result of good bodily conduct. Okay, there is, the key word here is bodily, verbally, and mental conduct. If you read by yourself, how much do you understand? What about harshness? This is the second way to train the tameable person mentioned by the Buddha. Okay. The Buddha talk about bodily misconduct, verbal misconduct, and mental misconduct. He talk about the result, the idea of misconduct and the result of such misconduct. What would happen if you do this unwholesome action? The Buddha point to that. And what about both? Sometimes the Buddha used both techniques, gentle and hardness. Okay? So this text explains the idea of how the Buddha trained the monks. It's repeat. Most of the sutra, you, will, you may notice that the teaching is repeat. It's the same manner. So don't, don't uh, be surprised. This is how it's the, it's the theme of the Buddhist text. Same thing with the chanting. Most of chanting also repeat, right? Go through the text first, and then I'll come back and explain in a moment. And if a tameable person doesn't submit, see, in the same manner as the case he explained to the Buddha how he, how, how he trained the horse, and that horse cannot be trained. That horse cannot be trained. The, the case he asked the Buddha the same question. So the Buddha used the same approach to reply, to answer back to the case he. So I train the monk the same way you train the horse, Gentleness, hardness, and combination of both techniques. And if that person, tameable person, doesn't submit with all of the things that you train them, what would you do? The Buddha said the same thing. I kill them. I kill him. See, the same manner. And then the case, he was shocked with this answer. But it's not proper for our blessed one to take life. And yet the, best, the blessed one said, I kill him. <laughs> you don't find this teaching style often in the text. This is called implicit. Implicit. What it means by kill? The Buddha is supposed to have loving kindness, right? And compassion. How can he kill being? That's case he was shocked in this answer from the Buddha. And then the Buddha, now it's our job to understand what it, it means by killing. I call it a noble killing. From my experience of studying the text, I came across two places, the idea of killing. The Buddha suggests to kill. Is there anything in this world that the Buddha or the Arahant suggests us to kill? Kyukilesa, good, good. That's a good thought. But in one particular teaching, the Buddha points us to kill anger. But Kilesa is good. It's more cover, anger is just one unwholesome kilesa, right? The Buddha, you suggest us to kill anger. This is called noble killing. If you, you are a monk, your most outstanding characteristic should be loving kindness and compassion. That's the first step of being a good monk. When i thinking of good monk, I don't think of wisdom. I don't think of disciplines. Somehow, I think of loving kindness first. If I meet the monk, any monk for the first time, I would feel comfortable to be 
around or to be near, close to a monk who, who spread loving kindness. I feel comfortable. I don't know how good he, uh, in terms of giving the Dhamma talk, I don't know how much he meditates during the day. But the person is kind, the loving kindness, no anger, always kind, always willing to listen, willing to support. That's my personal idea of when I meet someone. That's how I see it. So the Buddha suggests to kill anger. In this case, again, the word killing appears again in this particular sutra, that kill, I kill or I destroy him. What does it mean? This is what it means by totally kill or destroy. In the doctrine and in the discipline. Again, doctrine is what? Doctrine is Dhamma. And the discipline is the Vinaya. You see? Buddhism equal Dhamma and Vinaya. When the Tathagata or the Blessed One or the Awakened One doesn't regard one or the person as a being that worth speaking to or admonishing. And one's knowledgeable fellow, that means your fellow monks who are smart in the holy life, okay, don't regard one as a being worth speaking or admonishing. This is called totally destroy or kill. Or in other words, they don't speak to you. They don't correct you no more. They don't give you advice no more. That means you are killed. You are dead. And the, in the commentary, commentary means the book that explains what's in the text. This is the second layer. When you, the first layer is the Pali text in Pali. And it translates to Thai to English, whatever language. And then there will be another book. It's called Handbook. Handbook of the text is called commentary. The explanation what it means, uh, what, what the Buddha means you know, in this paragraph in the, in the Pali text. In the commentary explain that uh, usually if the Buddha give suggestion three times, three times, no more than that. And after three times, you still make no changes, show no respect. Nothing changed. The Buddha will stop talking to you. Your teacher will stop talking to you after three times. This is called killing. That means you're dead. You're a dead man. You're a dead monk. From that moment onward, you should feel regret. You should feel, feel bad about no one talking to you, no one correcting you, no one admonishing you. But some monk feel different. Some monk feel like, oh, now... The Buddha is no longer here. There was a monk who said this after the Buddha passed. He said, well, you know what? Let's celebrate. Now the teacher is not here. We can do whatever we want. You can do whatever you want. No one will correcting us. No one will say what we need to be doing. No more. This is called the monk named Supatha. And that is why the senior monk get together. Because he see the sign, the danger of what will be happening. So let's get together, five minute monk, and verify the teaching of the Buddha. Because the Buddha will not be with us physically no more. So we need the proof. This is his teaching. It's called the first Sankha meeting after the Buddha passed. In that first three months, they get together. And then they do their best to verify the teaching of the Buddha. Not only the teaching, they verify the Dhamma through Ananda. And they verify the Vinaya to Upali monk, the monk named Upali, who expert in Vinaya. Ananda is expert in the Dhamma or the teaching of the Buddha because he hear, he heard the teaching of the Buddha more than other monks during the Buddha time. So this means, uh, it's called noble killing. That means the Buddha killed the monk who cannot be trained by not speaking to that monk, by not correcting that monk. The teaching stopped. There is something called gentle, right? Gentle, gentle teaching. In many sutras, the Buddha gives very lovely teaching to monks and to the lay people. As I give you some names, the Metta Sutra, the Mangkala Sutra, the Latana Sutra, even Singkalawa, Singkalawa Sutra. This, the Buddha gives the beautiful teachings to the young man named Singkalaka after his parents passed away. The Buddha walked past by, the Buddha gave the teaching to him of how to live good life. Very gentle, very sweet. In some cases, the Buddha gives both gentleness and harshness in one teaching as well. In some teaching, which are very, very rare that the Buddha focus on the harshness teaching. 
not a lot of teaching in that side, but a lot of teaching on this side, on this gentleness. But in this teaching, for example, in Pala Pandita, can you guess what is Pala, what is Pandita? Huh? No. This is Pala, <laughs> the fool. Pandita means the wise. Pala means Pan. In Thai, Khon Pan, Pan. Bandit, Bandit. Bandit means wise. Okay, Bandit means wise. In this sutra, the Buddha talk about the characteristic of a fool and a wise in one, in one teaching. So that's why it, it's a combination of gentleness teaching and the harshness teaching. A fool man would, this is the character of the fool man. He would think bad, he would speak bad, he would do bad things, bad deeds. Oppositely, wise man, he would think good, he would speak good, and he would do good. He would do good. This is general idea. And the Buddha points to the result after a person think bad, speak bad, and do bad. Where did he go after he died? What would be the result? And same thing, uh, what happened if the person speak good, think good, and do good? What is the fruit, the benefit of doing that? So when you read the text, you say, oh, this is, this is, this is good, this is really gentle, this is very sweet, I want to be a good person. But for some people, you need to, to train in, in another way, to, to see the result first, then you're brave enough to not to do bad. Right? If, what if you kill, you lie, this is the result end up in hell, born as an animal ram, this and that. When you see the picture like this, that mentioned by the Buddha himself, then you get scared. When you get scared, you know what, I'm not going to do this. The reason you're not doing bad because you get scared. And the technical term for this is called otapa. Remember? Otapa is the moral fear. You fear of the consequence of doing bad. And this comes together with the word hiri. Hiri is the moral shame. And this is the moral fear. You feel shame of doing bad, that's why you don't do bad. You feel fear of the consequence of that bad action, that's why you don't do something bad. So the Buddha explained in detail what happens if you do bad thing. What option that available for you after you die. And what option that available for you if you do good thing. And there's a detail on that. So this is the idea of some sutra that use the combination of... Uh, the, the training techniques, gentleness and harshness, because people are different. For example, uh, there are many cases appears in the text that consider an untamable or untrainable person. In this particular teaching, the Buddha just lay out the detail of the consequence of doing good and the consequence of doing bad. Okay, but this I just add on to you based on my experience that you can, when you study, you can relate the Dhamma together and easy for you to, to follow. And now you can have this memorized. If you have the right view, view then you will acquire for more wisdom. Right view means, you know what, I'm new, I just ordained, there's a lot of things that I don't know. So whoever give the Dhamma talk, I will go listen. Whoever meditate, I will, I will ask them the question about meditation. Whenever the senior monk come, I will approach them, take care of them. Maybe I can learn something from them. You go from there. Okay, then all kind of things that you can, you can develop. But starting from this first. Brave enough to ask questions, brave enough to go, stay near the senior monk and open up your eye, your ear and listen to what he has to say. Even though you may not understand because he speaks in Thai, but there may be way, find way to understand what he, what he said. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, let's get to, uh, to know some example. Last week we talked about the monk named Tevatatta. Even though Tevatatta was born in a high class family, the same you know, royal family in the same rank as the Prince Tata or the Buddha to be. And he is considered the cousin of Prince Tata because his sister get married with Prince Tata, who happened to be the Buddha later on. Devatatta, I believe he has gone through all kinds of meditation practice. He listened to numerous teachings of the Buddha himself. But at the end, how can he turn himself against the Buddha? He wants to take over the Sangha, the monastic Sangha, to be the leader. And he even wants to kill the Buddha himself. And hire someone to kill the Buddha, to hurt the Buddha, to harm the Buddha, 
to break the sangha. He do all kind of bad thing. And why is that? And many times I believe that the Buddha may give him a, a private uh, teaching because they were very close. They cause him. This you shouldn't be doing. That you shouldn't be doing. Even though he still become that kind of person who neglect the teaching and turn himself against the Buddha. I like you to, to think deeper why he become like this. If you can think thoroughly, think it through, you will have this, the keen sense of observation, the keen sense of consideration, and it help you to, to start develop the right view for your own practice. Okay, we come back to this in a moment. And the second name most Buddhist people know is called Shanna. Shanna, who is Shanna? Shanna is this guy. Shanna was the personal attendant of Prince Siddhartha or the Buddha to be. They born the same date. The same date, same age, and the same date too. So Shanna took care of Prince Siddhartha when he was in the palace. Took him out, with his this and that, go to places together. And Shanna is the one who take the Buddha and left the palace and the Buddha to be ordained as an aesthetic. He become a monk. That's the Shanna. And later on, after the Buddha achieved enlightenment, he came home and gave the Dhamma talk and teach the Dhamma talk to people in his family in the palace. Shanna happened to be there and he also understand the teaching. He wants to become a monk too. And Shanna ordained. He got himself ordained. He followed the teaching of the Buddha. But the thing is, Channa is known for become a stubborn, very stubborn, very arrogant, because he feel proud that because of me, then there is the Buddha. I help him to get ordained. I help him to leave the palace. I prepare the horse. If you become that, imagine yourself. Okay, this is the Buddha. I know the Buddha even before he became the Buddha. I grew up with him. I took care of him. I even take him to the, uh, uh, help him to escape from the palace. In fact, the Buddha did, the Prince Siddhartha did not escape. Okay, I even helped the Prince Siddhartha or the Buddha to be, leave the palace and become an aesthetic. So he very proud of that. There's two things that uh, you guys should keep in mind. The first one is called titi. Titi is will. And Conceit, mana, mana is consist. This also consider a kilesa, that mana. Titi or will. You hear the word right titi, right? Samma titi or right, right seeing or right understanding. Samma titi, samma sangkapa. The word samma mean mean right, mean correct. So titi mean will. The first item on the list of the eight four path is called samma titi. That means you have correct view. If there is correct view, then there is an incorrect view. Channa happened to have an incorrect view, and he also have conceit. What is conceit? Conceit means you am better than you. I know more than you. I am important than you. I am more important than you. So when when Channa become a monk, he neglect the Dhamma. He did not study. He neglect the Vinaya. He make all kind of uh, uh, he break all kind of precept. And when even the senior monk Saliputta and Mokhalana give him advice, Ananta give him advice, he would ignore those advice. He doesn't care what the senior monk trying to give him the warning, try to admonish him. He doesn't care. He only listen to the Buddha. The Buddha call him and, and, and suggest him in person. He listened, but he still did not change. Let's go back to be the same old man. He ordained at the age of 80. You see? At 80 years old, how much a person are willing to change. He come to the Sangha or the nation with the idea of I am because of me, then there is the Buddha. I took care of the Buddha to be for a very long, long time. So you guys should respect me. You don't know anything about the Buddha life. I am the one who know a lot of things about the Buddha. With that conceit, with that self-deprived, with that wrong view, shall not become stubborn not willing to listen to anybody. And even the Buddha was still alive, the Buddha stopped teaching him. Just let him alone. The Sangha 
boycott him, nobody talk to him, nobody associate with him. And the Buddha give uh, permission to Ananda to execute the supreme penalty. It's called Prombihala, Prombihala Tham, Brahma, Brahmadana, Promatan, I'm sorry. It's called Promatan, Brahmadana. Brahmatan is considered extreme, supreme penalty or boycott. That means you don't exist. You may be sitting here, but you don't exist in our eye. We don't talk to you, we don't eat with you, we don't do things with you. You become nobody. You become the space. <laughs> you exist, but you don't exist among us. So after the Buddha passed, nobody, uh, Ananda executed this um, penalty to Channa. And later on, Channa was called into the Sangha meeting, 500 monks. Shanna was he willing to accept that he did something wrongly. He behaved himself wrongly. And the text said he fainted and wake up three times. When he looked his, look at his own behavior, he feel very shameful. He fainted and wake up. He fainted and wake up. He fainted and wake up three times. And after that, he left the Sangha, practiced on his own, and he achieved Arahan. He achieved Arahan later on. Even the Buddha was still alive, he achieved nothing. So arrogance. So be very careful. Be easy to admonish. This is something I like you to pay attention. Whether you are new or you ordain quite some time, if you feel like nobody can teach you no more, then you are dead. You cannot grow. Whether in the worldly life or in the spiritual life. And there are some suggestions that you can use, that you can use as a criteria to check yourself. Willing to listen. Are you willing to listen? Or even the same lecture, the same Dhamma topic that you learn already. Do you feel that I already know that, Lumpi, let's skip this. Give me something advanced. Willing to listen. Willing to make adjustment. Make some changes when you get uh, receive advice from someone. And don't look down the person who give that advice. If I suggest you to sit three hours, you may think, Oh, Lumpi Long Shai, do you yourself can sit three hours? If you cannot, then please don't tell me to sit three hours. Do you have that attitude toward your teacher or someone who gives you advice? Or you just pause and think, Oh, okay, how can I sit three hours? What benefit of me doing that? Toward that positive direction instead of five fall of the person who gives you advice. Right? Rejoice in advising because when someone gives you advice, that person is considered very brave. Why? Why is that? Right? If, if someone walk to you and tell you, Hey, Lung Pi Alex, you should dress better than this. It's like hit you in the face. That means the person needs to be very brave for you to getting mad, right? When you hear such uh, advice, you may be getting mad and you and him may lose good relationship. Alex may hate the person who say that. But the person walk into you with, with good intention, with loving kindness, but he may not know the proper timing or, uh, or, or express his feeling artfully. So telling the truth is one thing. But you need to know, is it the right timing? Or is, is something that you're about to say is from the bottom of your heart, you know wholeheartedly, I, I have loving kindness toward this person. That's why I want him to know. Not because you want him to look bad. Not only the truth, it needs to be the right timing. It need to, you need to speak from the loving kindness attitude. And then you say it. That, that means the person is brave. You need to admire that braveness that when they come to you and let you know. And when you want to give advice to your friend, you do in private. But when you want to press your friend, you can do in public. That's the idea. And be humble. Doesn't matter how long you are then. Be humble. Humble is a good characteristic to cultivate for the rest of your life. You look at the senior monk who came visit us the other days ago. 70 years old, 73 years old, or then more than 53 years. Very humble, laugh, smile, make us feel comfortable, right? And be patient for the teaching. 
remember the first enemy that I teach you of the first the the four enemy of of new monk the first thing on the list is unable to accept the teaching you think of the wave the wave of the ocean will keep hitting the shore day and night 24 7 non-stop the new monk the same the buddha trained his personal attendant ananda i will keep correcting you and pressing you over and over only the core will stand the rest will not stand so if you have this attitude that, you know what, I'm ready for any wave that come to me. I'm going to be patient. I know why I'm here. I know what I want in this spiritual life. There's a good monk that mentioned as well. His name is Ratha. Ratha ordained as a very old age. He was, have a good family. He was rich. And when he get old, his wife and his children left him. So he has no money. From a rich man to become a poor man, so he stay and in the temple and, and, and wait for food from the monk. And one day he feel like, I want to be a monk too. And nobody help him ordain because they feel like, oh, he is old, nothing much he can do. Only Saliputta, only Saliputta see that, hey, this monk, this person used to offering me food when he was rich. I went arms round in his house, he, he gave me food, he offered me food. So Sariputta recalled the goodness of this man. He said, you know what, I will help him ordain. And then Sariputta helped him ordain. And also Ratha monk is the first monk who ordained through Yati Chattutakam, the same manner that you guys ordain, by ask permission from all the Sangha, whether you want accept, you will accept this monk into the community or not. It's the Ratha. And when Ratha ordained at the old age, Ratha is the most outstanding monk who being humble, willing to learn, willing to accept, willing to change. Even he ordained at the old age. Obey, listen, kind, patient, humble, you name it. He have all of these characteristics even when he ordained at the old age. I think he is the only person that most outstanding in the whole teaching of the Buddha when it comes to a man who ordained at the old age but still open, willing to learn, willing to develop himself in anything that people give him suggestion, he would do it. Get up, 4.30, chanting, eating, arms round, cleaning the temple, he would, he would do his best. He wants to be trained. Okay? So, how can we develop this characteristic? If you reflect on this, this is what we chant every day, right? The 10 reflection. We monks, we should often reflect, should often, not just one time, that we must criticize ourselves, be able to take criticism from ourselves as the purity of precept. You reflect on yourself, you scrutinize yourself, you um, listen, welcome suggestion for, from, from your monk's fellow, from your teacher, to keep your precept clean. This is what we reflect every day. Do you really reflect on this? Or you feel like, I'm, I'm okay, I don't need any more suggestions, I'm okay. So discipline, respect, and be patient. This is something, please keep in mind, from day one that you enter this spiritual life until the day that you realize Nibbana. You have to have this built, otherwise you wouldn't last long. And many monks that I observe, okay, some monks, when I tell them to do something, they do it right away. Right away means instantly. Some monk, when I tell them to do something, they do it later. Some monk do it later and later. Some monk forget what I tell them to do. What is this telling me about this person as in the eyes of the teacher or the trainer? Now I know the characteristic of each individual that eagerly take advice, take the order of the teacher seriously. Some people like that. Some people, I'll do it later. Some people even forget. Someone, I asked three times, nothing changed, nothing moved, the job's still there. Now I, I stop asking. Either I do it myself, or I have someone do it for me. I give three times. Same manner, three times. If I say three times, no more, four times. So in this case, you may realize, oh, how come the Buddha is a unsurpassed trainer? How come he cannot teach sanna? How come he cannot teach tevatatta? 
if you don't think, you will look down the Buddha. That, oh, oh, okay, this is the Buddha cannot train this person. It's not the case, right? In 45 years, the Buddha teach every day. There will be someone that he help. The first thing he do in the morning, he meditate, and he would look through his meditation. Who should he dedicate his time to? Because his time is valuable. He would locate that person and teach the person, give the benefit to that person, right? But for someone that doesn't deserve his time, after three times advice, nothing changed, he would move his energy towards something else, someone else, same thing. It doesn't mean he cannot teach. It depends how you would manage your time because you only have 24 hours. There's a lot of you waiting for you in line that need your help. So you can direct your energy toward that, that person. That's maybe worth, worth, of, worth doing it instead of staying focused on someone that's not, not, not ready to be trained. You're going to waste a lot of energy and, and, and waste, uh, waste time for you to be able to help more people. In this particular teaching, I want to show you because it's related to what we just learned. When it comes to the monastic training, this name appears a lot, Kanaka Mokalana Sutra, which we did talk a little bit about it. And in this sutra, the Buddha said, suppose the deaf horse trainer, that means a guy who is very expert in training horse, will obtain, obtain, he receive a fine thoroughbred, that means a good horse. First of all, he would make it to get used to wearing the bit to have the, put the something into the horse, the, uh, like the seat, put over the horse, the back of the horse. In the same way, when the realized one, now you see, today we see the Tathagata, we see the blessed one, we see the awakened one, we see the realized one, point to the same person, which is the Buddha. The realized one get a person for training. The first guide them like this. Okay, what we see here. Before the Buddha trained the person, this is how he trained. This is the step, right? But before he trained the person, this is the prerequisite. That if I get a person who is ready to be trained, I will train him like this. This is the condition. The first step in training uh, monks in this particular sutra, the Buddha said, be ethical, restrained in the Patimokha or the monastic code. See, the Buddha talked about precept first. He did not teach you how to meditate first. Understand precept. Understand the manner. Conducting yourself well and seeking arms in the suitable places, seeing danger in the slightest faults, and keep the rules you have undertaken. This is this considered the step of training a man to be a monk and a monk to be a good monk. It's called gradual training, sequential training. And then later on, the Buddha elaborate a little bit more. Having taken up the rules, which is similar, right? After you ordain, you observe precept. He trained himself in them, in them mean in the patimokha, in the rule that you observe. You see the danger in the slightest fall. You come to endow with wholesome bodily and verbal action. His livelihood is pure. This is about arms round, about how you live your life. He possess, possesses the moral disciplines. He guard the door of sense faculties. He endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension, which is sati and sampachanya, and he is content. You see, the Buddha used a very simple word, but all of this is designed to train in step, in sequence. If we put in the picture, we will see something like this. This is from another teaching, Amaha Asapura Sutra, which we did talk about it. This sutra gives us the full illustration of how the Buddha trained the monk. For the first sutra, you only see a few steps. It depends on who that the Buddha gives this Dhamma to. The Kanaka is not the monk, he is the Brahmin, he is an accountant, he is a mathematician. He wants to know, he usually do things by step, step one, step two, step three, and he asks the Buddha, do you train, when you train the monk, do you have step in training them? The Buddha says yes, and then the Buddha give this explanation, give this explanation, but he did not give the full detail or every single step that how he trained the monk. But as you study more and more sutra, this is the one 
that the Buddha give the the fullest extent of how of the step that he trained the monks. Start from step number one, right? Hiri Otapa. Hiri Otapa. We did talk about this. Hiri Otapa. Moral shame and moral fear. And then purify body and speech and thought. Purify livelihood. Guard your sense door. Moderate in eating. You see, eating is here too. It's on the list. Practice wakefulness. Don't be lazy. Okay. Develop mindfulness and awareness. Sati and Sampachanya. Abandoning hindrances. Now you meditate, right? Meditation is here. Number eight, you sit. I start from here. This is samadhi or meditation. And this is wisdom. Okay? And this is sila. You cannot go wrong with this framework. Sila is about your manner. When you're comfortable with your sila, then you develop the mind. When your mind is being developed okay, higher and higher, pure, purer and purest, then you have access to the higher wisdom or the supra knowledge or the super knowledge, the three knowledge, the, na- the knowledge of you are able to recall your past life, you are able to recall someone's past life, and you have ability or knowledge to remove your ignorance, greed, hatred, and delusion from your mind. This is the 10th step that explained in this particular sutra. But before you can get to that, you need to be a person who ready to be trained. So the question is, are you ready to be trained? If the answer is yes, then you are welcome. The Buddha will train you like this. Step one, step two, step three, all the way until you achieve liberation, full liberation. So what have we learned so far today? About horses, about training, right? About being obedient. Now we see that the Buddha also have his own style, his, his own way of, of train monks by the compa- using the comparison of how a man train horse, right? When you get a good horse, you train like this, train gentle, train hard, or train both, gentle and hard. The Buddha also uh, trained the same way. So now you need to know what it means by training gently, training by, you know, uh, training harshly, and how to combine this technique when it's come for you to train others, or even when you receive the training, you know that I'm, I'm, I am this kind of person, I need to be pushed. Then you may feel connected to the mentor who like to push you. Then you will become, then you're willing to follow. But if you're in the survival mode, relaxation mode, you may not train a lot. So you need someone to push you. So there are ways to train a person. But the Toro breath, this kind of horse, he knows. He knows. His responsibilities. He know why. What his his job today. What he's supposed to be doing. He doesn't need anyone to come and tell him what to do. He know what time to get up. He know what time for the chanting. He know what time for breakfast. He know that he's supposed to do the dishes. He's supposed to he's supposed to clean the toilet. Nobody have to worry about his responsibility. He knows. He know how to dress. He know that the bus leave at ten, nine thirty. He get dressed already. It's not like 9.45, you're still having a cup of coffee. That means you doesn't know. You don't aware that people are waiting for you. If you are late, the whole group is late. This is the idea. This is called Toro Breath, horse or Toro Breath, man or Toro Breath, monk. You have integrities. Okay? You're smart. You be patient. And you are gentle. You have good manner. You observe precept. You know what to do, when to do, and you know how to do all of this. You need to continue uh, develop or master. Take your time. Okay? Today we learn the theory. Most importantly, you need to put into practice. Even one percent practice is better than nothing. Make changes. If nothing change, then you achieve nothing. Not you achieve nothing. You can become a monk ten years, twenty years. You achieve nothing in terms of precept, in terms of meditation, in terms of wisdom or the Dhamma that kept in the Buddhist text. If you don't read, how can you know? If you don't sit, how can you experience what is meant by jhana, what is meant by liberation? Right? You cannot. You have to sit, you have to study, you have to put into practice. And this is the, uh, the beauty of this particular teaching. So please keep on um, coming back to the sutra. I think each, 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 each sutra is unique. It, you can always learn something. 
from each sutra. Some may be difficult, some may be okay, some may be, you know, you have no idea what it is, okay, but it's okay. Just as, as long as you're still going back to the text, open it up, feel it, I believe you learn something. And that's, that's what happened to me. I pick up some keyword, and usually the sutra will repeat itself later on in the, in the future. As you keep on reading, you come across the same term, but you see different context. And now you can connect the dot. You see Hiri Otapa appears many places. You see mindfulness and awareness appear many places. You see Four Noble Truth appear throughout the text. Okay, so um, this takes time to, to gain this kind of experience, but please do not stop learning and, and developing yourself. Alright, so we're done for today.